I suppose I want to start off with, when we talk about mental skills, it's actually almost a mind jump. I think that's got something really important. I'm not going to stand here tonight and have a magic pen and we wave and you'll walk, walk away so it's mentally tough or mentally ready to go. So a lot of it will come back to, I suppose, your motivation, uh, what your goals are, and what you're really prepared to do. Because the reality is I'm really lucky, I get to work with some really cool people, we've been very successful in many different sports, and there's not a kind of a secret to their success. It's the ones who are prepared to persevere longer, it's long journey. The ones who are ready to manage setbacks, there's going to be plenty of those as you go through. And the ones, I suppose, who are really strong, why? Understand where they want to go with it. And so for you guys, you may all be sitting here with different goals, different aspirations, where you want to go. But when we talk about mental skills, it's, the reality is we're all born with a similar brain. It's really what you're prepared to do when you leave here tonight. So I thought I'd start off with just have a quick chat to your person beside you. What would be helpful to cover off? So you're all here, whether you have to be here or you've chosen to be, I've got no idea. But have a chat to your person beside you. We've got probably an hour, I think. What would be helpful to cover off from your point of view? I'll quick chat to the person beside you. If you don't know the piece, don't reduce yourself. So we're trying to pull something about art, you haven't heard before, is that right? Well, I don't know. That, something new, maybe. Something new. I'll work on that one. What else? Anything else? It helps like mental preparation before sports, like how to prepare it for my Perfect. Anything else? Yep. Have you had to manage a range of setbacks, so like a big injury or something like that? Yep, brilliant. Anything else? How to how to increase the, your drive to win? How to make yourself want to want to do better? Cool. Got anything else? Yep. Oh, that but with your team. Yeah. If you answer that question, let me know. <laughs> anything else? Starting point. Okay. Look, it's a nice small group, so please ask questions as we go through um, around it. But a couple of things you talked around there: role, role of emotions. What are you guys? What is the role of emotions? Why do we have emotions? We all have them. Yeah? Do we have motivation? Yeah, definitely motivation sometimes. What else? Um, what do emotions give us? We react to situations. To react to situations? Perfect. What else? Yeah? Help us connect with others. Help us connect with others. Perfect. Because when we talk about mindset, okay, just in a bit of paper in front of you, draw what you think the mind looks like. What does the mind look like? Now we'll hold it there for a sec. Who's got a picture of the mind? Anyone? What does the mind look like? Anyone know? Most people don't. Okay? When we talk about the mind, we think about it's the brain. 
So when we talk about mindset, it's understanding what does actually mindset mean and what sort of mindset do we need? Because often we talk about having a positive mindset. Who's heard that before? Yeah, it's bullshit, though. It's not that helpful. Okay. So when we talk about mindset, what mindset basically creates meaning for us. Okay. So when you came tonight, your mindset would give a meaning for being here. And that meaning would make sense in the sense I really want to be here because I want to learn something new. And guess what? You probably will. If the meaning you attach to tonight is I have to come here because I've been told to come here, that's your meaning, you'll probably learn jack shit. Because you'll just be sitting there going, I hope you shut up so I can leave something. So when we talk about mindset, it's not about being positive all the time because that's not right, it's not that helpful, and it's not always possible. It's understanding what beliefs or what meaning do we have around how we look at our games, our training, our teammates, winning, losing, and that's what we need to understand around mindset, which goes into our emotions. And our emotions are really important because it lets us know how we feel. Most of us aren't very good with those. So we're very good physically, if someone gets up and falls over and hurts their ankle, how do you know you've hurt your ankle? Feel it. Pain. What do you feel? Pain. Pain. Perfect. Well, the reason the body gives you pain is so you don't keep walking on it, because if you keep walking on your ankle, what's going to happen? You're going to make it worse. But if you're sitting here now, you're already pissed off and frustrated and shitty, and you finish the session, you'll get up and walk out. You go to the next thing. Okay. We're not very good at managing our emotions or even identifying our emotions. So it's ability to go, actually, if I'm really grumpy and I'm really shitty at the moment or frustrated at the moment, what do I need to do with that? So if you do nothing with it, what happens? Yeah, and then what happens? Well, it usually goes out, don't be blood. Okay. So emotions are a really important part of sport in our lives. We want to feel them joy, gratitude, positive emotions. Well, we've got all those emotions. And the key thing around positive and negative emotions, it kind of sets us up a little bit because it almost goes, a negative emotion is not what I want. Well, what's wrong with negative emotions? They often keep us safe sometimes. They can motivate us sometimes. So I'm really frustrated with this train tonight, so I need to go back and be smart with my training. And we kind of get into this false sense of security that we've got to feel good all the time. Well, if you want to play high-performance sport, I'm assuming that's why you're in the room, you're not going to feel good all the time. You're going to feel good sometimes. But the best athletes are able to manage when they don't feel good. And that's the key part of this. If you think you've got to feel good to perform, you'll perform once or twice a year. Okay? If you understand, I don't need to feel good, I don't need to feel certain emotions to perform. Who thinks confidence is important here? Okay, so if zero was, it wasn't important and 10 out of 10 is the most important thing, who would give it a 1? 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 -ish, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, anyone? Yeah, perfect. Did you tell yourself to be confident? Did you, did you go shit be confident? Uh, yeah. Ready? The first piece never. <laughs> okay. What did you say to yourself when I said catch this? Um, I was like, oh, just prepare what you're going to say if you need to draw the horse card. <laughs> when I said catch this, what did you do? I thought. What did you do? What allowed you to catch it? Um, having confidence that I could. So why say, can you look over there, look over there for a second? Oh, <laughs> why did you catch it? Um, wasn't looking. But you're confident. Why didn't you catch it? Why didn't you catch it? Can't see it. So what was he not doing? Not looking. looking. Sorry. <laughs> why didn't you catch it? It wasn't concentrated. It wasn't focused. So we get too caught up in, I've got to feel good, I've got to feel confident to perform. Bullshit. You're not always going to feel confident. What you need to be is focused. Same in a lecture. Most of you aren't. You go and have your phones and everything else and you don't focus. So ability to be focused, attention is the currency of performance. That's it. Okay. So notice over the next 40 minutes, wherever it is, how often your attention shifts. So 
what's for dinner tonight, we've got study today, this is helpful, this isn't helpful, what I did in the weekend, what's coming up? Okay. So the brain is basically a thought machine. It's constantly making thoughts all the time. And often we get caught up in what are the thoughts we need, well I think I need to be confident, don't get me wrong. If you can build confidence, make sure you do that, it's really important. If you're relying on confidence, then you're not in performance. You can control your focus. You can control where your attention needs to be if you choose to. Okay. How often do you guys practice focusing? Five once a day, Perfect, once a day. Go ask practice focusing. That's kind of yes, no, in between. Um, a little bit. Like, I try to make sure I'm on the Yeah. Pretty hard, eh? Yeah. Can we? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And most of us we don't. Once, you know, when we're at school, we're told to always focus. Okay, and concentrate. Which teacher taught you how to do that? Put your hand up. Anyone had a teacher that taught you how to do that? You're lucky. Most of them has told us to focus. And the reality is, as a student, when can you practice focusing? God, thank God for that. Yes, in lectures, you're there every day, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> this is a muscle. We're going to treat it as a muscle. We don't. We work a lot of hope in sport. Hope is not a great plan. I hope I'm confident this weekend. Hope I can focus. Hope the weather's good. Hope I'll play. Now, if you choose to, this I'm saying, when we talk about, for me, mental skills, sports psychology, it's, it's life skills. How do I use my life to get better at my sport? How do I use my sport to get better at my life? And just use the next 40 minutes or so, just notice, okay, how often am I listening and how often do I shift? Because you're gonna shift, I'm gonna shift, we all shift. But then how do I notice I'm shifting and bring it back? Because then we start managing our thoughts, we manage our emotions, we manage how we feel, we manage our behaviors. If we don't understand those, and let ourselves go, which most of us do, it's not a criticism, we're just not very good at it, we don't, train this stuff. If you do mindfulness meditation, you've got more of a chance of doing it. But most of you this morning when you got up and had a shower, one of the last things you did was what? What did most of you do before you left the house or flats or wherever you are? What did you look in? The mirror. Perfect. Don't be embarrassed me, when I'm in the mirror. Shouts <laughs> here, how we look in is all match up. But how often do you look inside yourself? Most of us don't. The best athletes are self aware. Okay? They're aware of what they're feeling, they're aware of what they're thinking. And awareness gives you power to react to it or actually respond to it. If we're not aware, then it starts to happen. Okay? So I've kind of gone all over the place there. Does that answer the question about emotions somehow? We've got a little bit of yeah. um, Someone talked about something new. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. There's nothing new. Neuroscience is new, which is great. And often as athletes, coaches always go, what's the next new thing? Just get better what you're already doing. Okay? And that's the thing about it, is that the top athletes will do the simple things more consistently than you guys will. Okay? So what's a really simple thing you guys should be doing? What's, what's the cheapest drug in the world that's legal? Water. Yep, something else though. Cheapest struggle in the world. Perhaps you perform performance all the time. What's that? Sleep. Sleep. How many of you have your phones beside your bed? Okay. You're all dicks. <laughs> okay. You know it's not helpful. It does not enhance performance in any way. You will have a phone beside your bed. What's the first thing you check in the morning? Why? What's happened in that eight hours? <laughs> <laughs> that if you don't check it, COVID will get released again. Nothing. And this is the bit around is that you know we're looking for these really secret things. If I do that, that will make me great. Brian O'Gara used to coach Crusaders a couple of years ago, assistant coach. He used to be great because we'd have a lot of people coming for Crusaders to watch, observe. And what he used to do to people, we'd take them around and he'd go, oh, that room down there, you can't go to that room. They go, why not? He goes, that's the secret room. What do you mean? He goes, 
that's the stuff you can't see. It was a cupboard, they'd know that. <laughs> so all week they go, can we look at the room, can we look at the room? No, no, that's, that's the bit you can't do. Look at everything else, you can't go there. And they get sucked into it. Oh, this is secret. End of the week, oh, do you want to look at that room? Sure. There's a, there's a cupboard, there's some rooms. We're all looking for the secret. We all get sucked into There's a silver bullet out there, there's something that will make me better. No, get a good night's sleep. But that's really boring, aren't you? You don't want me to tell you that. Because that's boring, that means I've got to change my behaviour. I don't want to do that either. So really think about, you know, what are the key little things you have to do? So what's new? Get a good night's sleep. Who here gets more than 10 hours sleep? Put your hand up. I'm almost embarrassed. <laughs> Pretty loud and proud of that one. Awesome. Who gets between 8 and 10 hours sleep? Not too bad. Who gets under 8 hours sleep? Okay, back to the class. This really start this morning. <laughs> Who gets under six? Now look, I could go on about sleep all day, but I won't. But the reality is, it's the best form of recovery. It's when the brain recovers, when the body recovers. Now I know as a student, there's times that will be compromised. So it's not about being perfect for this. Okay? But depending where you want to go with your sport or your life, sleep is one of the best performance enhancers. And it's free. Yet most of us compromise it. Okay? So work out now for you, what's the best time to go to bed? As I said, it's only moved to 8 to 10 hours. There's always some outliers, don't get me wrong. There's some people that can actually survive on less than that. But my experience is not too many of them. Okay, so going back to what's new, the little thing is done well. Okay? If you reflect on when you perform the best, it's often the little things done well. It's not the big stuff. Okay? What's the other question? Okay, mental prep. What do we mean by mental prep? Any ideas? What actually is mental prep? Being ready for anything. Being ready for anything? Yeah, but what does that mean? How do you mentally prepare for that? Focus on the goal. Yeah, focus on the goal. Perfect. Yeah. What else? What's mental prep? You've got a game this weekend, it's Monday, what's mental prep? Yeah? Um, so yeah. yeah? So how do you do that? Um, well, for me, I just like to try <laughs> You try and breathe? I hope you breathe. Oh, no, like, like, you know, control breathing. Control breathing, perfect. And how often do you practice that? Um, before. Before a game? So once a week? Or like going to like, Yep. So often we talk, you talk to the athletes, you know, what's important for you to play well? And they say being calm. Awesome, great. How often do you practice being calm? And we don't. Okay, we've got this massive thing around, we've got to be on the grass, we've got to be in the court, we've got to physically train. Yeah, that's an aspect to it, don't get me wrong. But once you've mastered the skill, it's like a catching, because most of you can catch or throw or pass whatever sports you do. Because you've mastered that skill, 90% of it, or 40 to 90% of it now, it's psychological. The reason you drop that before is not because you couldn't catch it, because you weren't focused. So we're going to start thinking about what are we doing mentally to now prepare for what's going to happen on the weekend? Because often we go and I hope the game goes well, or I hope the event goes well, or I hope the opposition is not very good. The ability to adapt is one of the key things, especially if I look at this year. That's the massive focus for now is how do we adapt to what's going to happen when we're in Tokyo? It's going to be different. And the athletes that adapt mentally will be the ones that perform. Not physically, that's mentally. That's not a new okay. if you so, If you have a uh, like, physical routine that you do for your warm-up, so we have the same routine yeah. for volleyball over and over and over again, would you suggest the same routine? for like mental preparation? Yeah, definitely. And what would that look like? Well again, this, this is where everyone's individual around it, but I, I'd strongly suggest there should be some form of imagery done during, throughout the week. Some form of imagining the situation we need to put this out into. And you already do it, because you dream. What we don't with imagery is put a bit of structure in it. Okay? And the view of imagery, you can imagine it from every angle. You imagine yourself watching on TV through your own eyes. And when we talk about imagery, it's actually using all your senses. 
imagine going to the volleyball court and feeling the, your shoes hit the wood. Feeling a little bit kind of excited, but a couple of nerves, but being able to breathe. Hearing what you can hear around you, seeing what you can see around you. And the beauty of imagery, you don't have to do it for 10 hours a day. And particularly now that living can buddy recorded, it's a great way to sit at home, watch yourself do the school, on your phone or iPad, wherever it is, stop, pause in your breath, close your eyes, and imagine yourself doing the school. Okay. The brain's designed for one thing and one thing only. What's the brain actually designed for? Anyone know? Survival. Okay. So throughout the week, you're going to try and reassure this brain that you will survive out in that course. If he doesn't think it will survive, what happens? What does it do? It panics. And then what else happens? Yeah, so what happens with panic? What do we feel? Stress. What else? Pepper. What else? Anxious. Anxious. Pepper. So what happens to us? How does our performance go? Oh, good. It's terrible. We've all done that. And this comes back to that mental prep. What are you prepared to do to soothe the brain? So often we talk about clarity. Clarity breeds confidence. Confidence doesn't breed clarity. What do you need to know about the game? What do you need to know about your role? What do you need to know about the game plan? What do you need to know about the opposition? What do you need to know about where you're playing? The brain hates uncertainty. That's why COVID has mucked up so many people. It's uncertain. That's why the earthquakes for years mucked up people because it wasn't the one earthquake, it was the 10,000 earthquakes. When's the next one coming? I don't know. Oh, there is there. The brain doesn't like that, it likes certainty. So when you talk about your mental preparation, you break it down simply as that control, influence, can't control. What are the things I can focus on this week which I can control? What are the things this week, this week I can influence? My teammates, my coaches, the opposition through body language. What can I control? Well, quite a bit of stuff. But generally what creates stress is when we focus on what we can't control. And we go from the present moment into the future. Okay. So when we talk about mental preparation, think about, okay, what do I need to do throughout the week? What do I need to do at training? Okay. So I've done a lot of talking. So turn to the person beside you. Imagine whatever sport you play, you are training straight after this. Okay. If the coach doesn't turn up, have a chat to the person beside you, what are you going to do at training tonight? Two minutes, what are you going to do? No coach there, what are you going to do? When you look at it, and this is a question for everyone else, when we look at ourselves performing, what do we generally look at? 
outcome? Yep, what else do we look at? The negatives. The negatives. Okay. Who looks at negatives first with your hand up? See, we're meant to laugh. <laughs> Just if confidence is really important, you yeah, will look at negatives, then we'll build confidence. Yeah. So I want you to really think about when we talk about training, it becomes really important. As you said, we can't expect coaches or others to motivate you and set goals. Every time you go to train, you've got to ask, why am I here? If you can't answer that question, go home. Because all you're going to do is, whatever you train, you'll get better at. Sounds obvious. If you train bad habits, you just get better at bad habits. If you train bad technique, you get better at bad technique. So it's been really clear that I want to make sure you're doing a training tonight. So the simple process I want you guys to think around is, okay, right, each time you train, right, what is my goal tonight? And this is the real one-on-one stuff, and it's the bit... You know, at the top level of the athletes are with, they still do this every time. The good coach goes, right, what's your goal today? And often with young athletes, they roll their eyes. It's like, well, if there's no goal, why are you here? It's like tonight, you should have all had a goal for coming here tonight. Because that way when you finish tonight, you either go, yep, I got that information, or no, I didn't. So if you've got no goal for being here, you just kind of just hold on to something, and hopefully something falls out of the sky, that would be helpful for you. Yeah. Just having a clarity of goal. And once you see a goal, it's right. First question, what went well? Okay. Practice doing that. Because we're so good at that negative bias as to go what didn't go well. And we do, again, the top athletes, how was your game? Oh, I dropped two passes. I didn't ask that. I said, well, how was your game? And we automatically go into that negative. But well, we're not building anything up there yet, apart from shit. It's not helpful. So what went well? Practicing, changing the lens, what went well? You could have the worst game in the world, I can guarantee what went well, I persevered. I kept going, going forward. I stayed focused. I was still a good teammate. Look for things that went well, ideally which is attached to your goal. Then your next question you ask yourself is, what did I learn? Okay. That's it. Because often when we finish a game, we just dissect the hell out of it, don't we? Then it sits in our head for another couple, couple of days. Anyone kind of root? Oh, it's in the game for a couple of days afterwards. Ground seekers. Does it change the game at all? No. But it changes your attitude, eh? It changes how you feel, and it changes your emotion. So everyone else has moved on from the game, but you're still stewing. And you can, at the end, you can chuck in a couple of questions. You know, what am I now curious about? Or what surprised me? What am I now grateful for? So we've got to start changing the lens. We want to build confidence. We want to build positivity, we can't build it best keep focusing on that. And unfortunately some coaches will. I've sat through some review and you're sitting there going, man, I felt terrible afterwards, I didn't even play. Because all we're looking at is what, knowing what people didn't do. And again, you've got to control this by going, right, every time I train, right, what's my goal? What am I doing tonight? Right, at the end of right, what went well? What did I learn? It's going to be choose to what I'm now curious about, or what surprised me, what am I grateful for? Okay. So, what else? What other things will people do at training? What are some other plans? What other people do? Okay. Um, I've just got a specific program, so I'll just stick to that. Okay. Who's, who's going to be the program? Um, my coach. It's an um, 18 week long German weightlifting program. Yeah. Um, it's kind of old school, it's from the 80s, so it's just. There's no drugs involved, is it? No. Chicken <laughs> um, Hades wasn't a great time. Yeah. <laughs> There's not many accessory lifts, so it's just lots of squats and balls and lots of lifts. I just do that. Do you question it? Not really, it's worked pretty well. Okay. Remember, be a student of the game. Be curious. It's not about questioning why am I doing this, it's like I'm curious about how will this benefit me? How will this help? Because what we want you guys to be is independent. So we want a situation where the coach doesn't turn up and you go, cool. Nothing changes. Because we're so reliant on being told. As a general rule, athletes are really bad at this. If they're not playing well, all they want is feedback from the coaches. Why do we seek feedback all the time? Reassurance? Yeah. But what we're doing is we're putting our reinsurance in someone else's hands. I hope the coach is in a good mood today. I hope they've got time to give me feedback. I hope the feedback's good. Coaches aren't great at giving you feedback, so they usually wrap it up and make it too fuzzy. Okay. 
there's nothing wrong with that, it's not a criticism, but often we don't want to offend people. If you're clear on what your goals are, you should be able to feedback yourself. Okay? Right, this is what my goal was, this is how I measure it, there's your feedback basically around it. Because you want to be independent of what you, where, where you want to go to school. Otherwise we're putting our self-worth into someone else's hands and hopefully they say the right thing. And some coaches are really good and they're really skilled at giving you feedback. Who's some coaches that have not been skilled at giving feedback? Anyone? Yeah. How was it for you? Because yeah. words are the second most powerful drug in the world, which are free. Sleep's the first. Words are the second. But words are so powerful. And there's some amazing coaches out there and there's some amazing good people who are coaching who get it wrong. And that's not a criticism, it's just sometimes they get it wrong. And that's why, again, if you guys can take control of that, you're actually going to feel better than yourself. But if you're just being told all the time, then we're not learning. So part of it, what are you trying to do, basically? Yeah. So, same the thing around, I'm just going to fast on a couple of slides here. Hang on there for a second. Oops, this is shit itself. Okay, it's stuck on mindfulness, which is stuck on that for a second. Okay, mindfulness, who knows much about mindfulness? This is a change tape for a second. What's mindfulness? Being aware. Being aware? Yep, what else? Yep. It's like being very aware of your surroundings instead of thinking like the future, the past, you're just aware of the current moment. Yep, so looking to be current moment. Oh, it's working again now. So it's stuck on mindfulness for a second. Yep, what else? Here's a bit of a giveaway for you. What else? Being aware of the consequences of your actions. Yeah, I suppose so. <coughs> yep. Yeah. Here we go. Because this, for me, if you look at it, I love this as a tool. I love it. This is a, it's a light tool. Some people like it, some people don't. This isn't the tool, because it's lots of tools. But for me, when you guys play the best in your sport, or when you're at your best, generally you're out here. Your present. Yeah. And when you do sit in the past, the future is not for very long, we can bring ourselves back. Okay. So when we talk about mindfulness, paying attention in a particular way, key thing there, it's on purpose. So it's not, oh I hope I'm paying attention, it's actually really clear I'm focusing on this. As we said at the start, attention is the currency of performance. Where's my attention? But the bit that's really interesting is this bit, non-judgmentally, what does that mean? What does non-judgmentally mean? Accepting. Nice, accepting. Think what else? <coughs> what does non-judgmentally mean? You're open to feedback and stuff like that going on. Yeah, we've got a bit more open to feedback. Cool. What else? Yeah? Well, that adapt to the situation and Yeah, perfect. What else? Because what's wrong, if we flip it over, what's wrong with judging? Yeah. Kind of decide if it's either good or bad. Yeah. So we get that good or bad scenario. We just go, Nelson Mandela had a great quote, you know, I never lose, either win or I learn. Yeah. I never lose, either win or I learn. That's what your training should look like every day. So we go good and bad training, often a bad trainer is making mistakes. Is that what you to say? Yeah? We go, oh, it was a bad training. That's the best training ever. Because it means you've got to sell your comfort zone. Too many people try to practice perfect. Why would you try and practice perfect? Why would you try and do that? Who does that sometimes? Anyone? A lot of people do. Why do we try and do that? When we learn something new, what goes into learning? Um, failure. If you're not failing at training, what are you actually doing here? Because my guess is you're staying in the comfort zone to get selected and that's it. You're trying to keep everyone else happy because it's comfortable. Training and practice is about getting better. The only way you get better 
is pushing. You know? What happens when we push is we get it wrong. But that's not getting it wrong. It's we're learning how not to do it. And I'll say this to the athletes too often. When I say that, I was the same. I'm not saying I was great in your age, I wasn't. So I was trained the wrong stuff. I was worried about what would people think if I get this wrong. Often I challenge the athletes, I'm like, you know, go to training tonight, drop the first three balls. I'll do this. You can almost tighten up. Or well, why? Because who cares? If you can't drop three balls of practice, how can you do that in the game? How do you practice your process for dropping balls if you don't practice that in practice? Okay? So when we talk about training, it's like, well, you've got four options to train. You can train in your comfort zone, which is nice, don't get me wrong, it's awesome. And it really depends on your goals. You can go in the avoidance zone, I ask the avoidance things I can't do. That way I look okay. And no one knows I'm not really or when you start going, well, what's the learning zone look like? What does it look like? Why are you going to learn something tonight? What's the goal I'm seeing which is going to push me a wee bit? Then we go into that growth zone. I'm actually starting to grow now. And the last zone is kind of the stretch zone. What am I doing there to really stretch myself? Because when you go to the gym here, you don't do the same weights, do you? Why not? You get stronger. You get stronger. So you've got more weight on the bar. And what goes with that, sometimes you don't finish a rep. We don't seem to care of that, do we? But your training is exactly the same. When we start judging, we don't train. We exist. Now, I'm really lucky I've got to work with really cool people from working in schools to businesses to sport. Guess what? We're all the same. We're all scared of the same stuff. What are we scared of? What's that? Cardio? Yeah, what else? What else are we scared of? Other people judging you. Perfect. Other people judging us. Brilliant. What else? What else are we scared of? Cut the spiders. <laughs> you see that? What's that? Just down things. Not fitting in. Now, when we're born, we're born with two fears. What are the two fears we're born with? Falling. Falling? Perfect. What else? Loud noises. So that suggests then everything else we'll learn. Okay. If we talk about mindset, has anyone got young nephews or nieces around here? Little kids, anyone? Yeah. Think about your mindset right now around failure and judging that sort of stuff. Imagine if you're a one year old learning to walk. What would have happened? You wouldn't walk, would you? You get up and fall down, get up and fall down, go, shit, everyone's watching me. What are they thinking? I'm shit at this, can't do it. <laughs> I'm going to sit down. Yeah, if I shit myself, guess what people think about? What ass? I don't do anything. So we, think we were born with this mindset of curiosity, of growth, of not caring. And at some stage, we suddenly went, uh oh, don't make mistakes. Really perfect. Probably the first time your mum or dad or whoever it was chucked a ball at your head in the head, you laughed. And we cry. You stop. And then you beat yourself up and turn I'm not good enough now. So when we talk about mindset around where we want to be, in the sense of being mindful, we just want to be a kid. Because we take the stuff too seriously. It doesn't matter where you're going in sport, it's still sport. It's a game. It was invented for entertainment to enjoy ourselves. Now it's the billion dollar industry. And we're ruined. So for you guys, it's about how do I take that back? When I go and play my sport, how do I play it for the love of sport? How do I play it to ensure my focus is not getting better? Because if I do those things pretty well, this stuff will sort of south out. Because we get so caught up in this outcome stuff that when you get there, you're probably going to enjoy it. Because yep. if the outcome was what makes everyone happy, would it be all black, silver fern, black stick? Black cat, starting to give up all the ones now. They should all be happy. And they're not. Okay. So we're going to trace this stuff non judgmentally. Practice our ability. Next time you walk through a record and mall, do it non judgmentally. Just notice it. Next time you walk into a lecture, notice your judgment. So we're judging all the time. So when we talk about mindfulness, practice being present. In this moment, so you can do that through meditation, you can do that through 
Simple stuff. Next time tonight, hope you know you'll clean your teeth. Stop and pause and actually just mindfully clean your teeth. Just actually feel it. So often, we're doing this, watching the phone, talking to people. Just stop and pause and oh, just be mindful clean my teeth. When you read a book, great mindfulness exercise. Especially a textbook, eh? Get to the bottom of the page and oh my god, I've read none of that. Start again. <laughs> be a bit more mindful. Practice focusing. Next time you have a coffee, stop and pause. Feel the cup. Taste the coffee. You're in such a hurry. So our ability to stop and pause becomes really, really important. So as this one here kind of touches on, is that often there be a stimulus in action and often we react. When we talk about being mindful, it's our ability just to practice stopping and pausing. So you can then respond. So let's do a simple exercise now. You can sit as you're sitting ideally. If you can, put your hands on your knees. If you can't, that's fine. But just sit upright. Uh, if you're comfortable keeping your eyes, close your eyes, do so. If you're not, keep them open. So all I want you to do when I ask you to is just forward it for one minute. It's just notice your breathing. Don't change it. Just notice it. Okay, and as you notice your breath, you might notice your mind shift off. Let it shift, cool. And then bring it back and just notice your breathing. And that's what you might breathe through your nose, you might breathe through your mouth, you might notice different things. So just do that for one minute. Starting now, away we go. Just have a quick check for the person beside you. What did you notice during that minute? Have a quick check for the person beside you. I think that I'm going to have this. And also, the way that I'm going to Less autonomous, you started trying to think about what you're doing, which you don't. Yeah. It's harder just to do it naturally. Perfect. And look, for some people, the breathing exercises, they struggle because they start overthinking their breathing. So don't do that. Um, we're going to do the breathing one. But generally, when we do that exercise for most of us, when we kind of start noticing stuff, we generally feel a bit calmer. Okay? It's not a calming exercise, it's not a breathing exercise. It's just what I see. Often the byproduct of mindfulness at times is we feel calm. But the view of mindfulness is that science is just more about being present. I can I do a lot of public speaking, um, and I still get nervous. So I just accept that I always get nervous. Isn't it? It's this size group or a big group or small group. So for me, it's like I don't fight anymore. I just make sure I've got something in my hand. Surprise, surprise, over there. I make sure I've got a drink bottle. Okay. So for me, it's about what support do I need to ensure that when I, if I'm nervous, I can still perform. So it's not about getting rid of nerves. There wouldn't be an athlete I know who does not get nervous. It's more about when I feel nervous, what do I need to do? When I have to look at my watch, I look at that and look at my heart rate. 
it's set to the same thing. I go good, I'm good to go. Oh, it's crept up. Right, just a little bit of breathing off. Nice, put my hand on the tummy, just a bit of belly breathing. No one even knows. Just to bring myself in. And it's the same with you guys. It's being aware of, okay, when I start feeling this certain way, where my emotions are coming into it, what do I do to bring it down? It's almost like a bit of a red counter in the car. So most of the hope in the mind, most of you are probably sitting about one or two thousand reds, not much of that, it's all pretty proof. Okay. The wife said, well I actually did, I got here earlier tonight, and I put a two stickers under two chairs in this room. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you guys to check that out. Okay, if you do have the, one of the stickers, you're going to have to come up here, we're going to record you. The camera's not here, perfect. And we need you to sing and dance to Justin Bieber, or a song of your choice. Okay, and then we'll record it and put it on the Facebook. There's always one in the room going, should I hope so? Who's that? There's always one. But for most of you, generally, your rev counter will probably start moving up a little bit. Is he being serious? Is he not? What do you pick me? Is that my bed? Is that my table or not? And it starts going up. Okay. So it's the same as we get closer to a game. So when we talk about our mental preparation, it's being aware of what arousal we're going to need to be to play at to ensure it's a healthy place. Because arousal is great. But if we get over aroused, we don't pick that well, we know our sight. It's diminished to our thought process comes, our decision making comes. So often mindfulness is a nice way of kind of going, right, I can feel my rev counter going up, I just want to bring it down a little bit. I want to still sit around here, but I don't want to be over here. So the beauty of mindfulness is said it can be a day to day um, day to day life skill. As I said, there's heaps of apps, here's me saying don't use your phone, but there is some apps for your phone you can use. Um, you know, it's said, Get into lecture early, sit there for 30 seconds, just, just notice my breath. If I change it, just notice it. Then practice folks in, in the lecture. Right, I might sit there for um, the first five minutes already focus. Then when my mind shifts, I'm going to practice running back. Could be brushing your teeth, it could be walking through university, right? So I'm just going to really kind of feel my feet as I walk through. Because often we're quite mindless. And at times it's really appropriate because we can get quite creative. So for me driving, it's a great time to be mindless, I get quite creative. Often I have my phone on the front of the, front of the car, I have audio ready to go. So after my presentations, I have ideas. So that gets us creative. But sometimes we actually need to, need to bring it in. And the beautiful of things like mindfulness, it can be through touch. If you watch Sammy Whitelock on Saturday as he come out, you see him run out and breathe and you see him do this. Okay? So he'll be feeling his hands. He won't just be doing this for the sake of it. Be very clear around feeling his hands. You watch all the boys' socks, pulling their socks up. Mouth guard in, mouth guard out. It won't be random. It'll be very intentional just to ground themselves back and be very mindful of feeling the mouth guard in the hand. Drink bottle, feeling the drink bottle. So sometimes we just need to bring ourselves back into that moment because we know as you go higher up in the sport, there's more expectations, there's more pressure. And the beauty of that, you're probably in the gym or doing some physical stuff getting ready. But what are you doing mentally to get ready for this? Because that's my, that's my experience. It's not, the, it's not the most talented athletes to get through it. Okay? I've more really talented athletes who don't make it. And that's fine. Sometimes it's their choice. Sometimes it's not their choice, but they just make bad choices. That's the ones. What are you prepared to do each day? Okay? Because we've all got reasons not to do things. I'm too busy. And often we do a lot of work in business, and you go into some of those places, lawyers and accountants, and you talk about some of the stuff about being mindful and looking after themselves, and the general answer is, oh, I'm too busy to do that. Okay, cool, everyone get your phones out then, please. Okay, can everyone please tell me their screen time this week? The minimum's two hours each day. You're trying to tell me you're too busy. Now you're choosing to be busy doing wrong stuff. Now, with technology, I'm going to sound like your parents, you're going to treat your phone like any other drug. If you haven't seen the social level all that stuff, we'll watch it. It's true. And it's like alcohol or anything else. They're not bad things. But the thing we want to go with your goal, which is we we'll to work out, do I want to spend a little time flipping through shit? Or actually getting better at something? So how you use your time becomes really, really important. So we talk about mindfulness as I said. Play around with it. Find out something that works for you. Practice it. Bring it to your already routine you've got. You improve being more mindful 1% a day, 7% a week, 30% a month. Change becomes easier. Okay. So that's the beauty of mindfulness.
If you wait for the final game of the season, it's the big final. Right, I'll be mindful this week. Good luck. Because the brain will go, I'm not used to this. The brain loves the routines, loves the habits. Is there any questions on that? Because one of the questions someone asked is, how do you increase the drive to win? Who asked that? What do you mean by that? Um, going to an event and got a goal. It's like if the goal um, becomes out of reach or you achieve the goal before the end, how do you get yourself to go beyond that? Cool. To describe winning or define winning for me. Oh, coming first or coming your goal finishing place? Yeah. How much control in most sports do we have of achieving it? So when we talk about goals, and often we, we talk to athletes around what success. Okay? And so I work a lot with cricket, it's the same thing there. So we talk with bats and, and women, okay, what's success for an innings for batting? Now what's generally the answer? Run count. Runs. Oh yeah, awesome, let's run with that for the next three weeks. There you go. Doesn't go too well. Because their success is about getting runs. They've got no control over that. Okay, particularly correct. There's some sports you've got more control, some you've got less amount of control. So often we're talking about, okay, what can we control? We can control our preparation, our mindset, our game plan, our intentions, what we're trying to do. So those are the things we want to hold on to. You talk about motivation, it's actually more about dedication. Because motivation requires us to probably enjoy a little bit more. You're not always going to enjoy it. The top athletes are prepared to be dedicated longer. Most of us want it to be comfortable, we want it to be fun, in the sense of when I say fun, easy. It's not easy, it's incredibly hard. I mean, 30 years ago you could drink, smoke, and eat shit and be quite good. Okay? You missed that time, sorry. Because that's when sport was really pure. There was after match functions, everyone hung around and did stuff, and it was actually really cool. There was communities and clubs and things we used to have. Now we don't have that. It's a real shame. Because we've got caught up on what winning looks like. So I'm going to keep going coming back to what you're saying. So, Understand, okay, well, what does winning look like and what does success look like? I really want you guys to think about this for your sport and what it goes back to what you can control. But breaking those things down to little things, what's the little one today? Well, I turned up in time, perfect, let's build on that. I set a goal, perfect, let's build on that. I did that one thing I haven't been able to do once, didn't do it ten times, but once, let's build on that. That becomes the winning side of it. Okay? And then having those little goals to keep reviewing. Remember, all goals are is a place to review it. Goals aren't a destination. It's not for the Olympic athletes at the moment. A lot of them now are working on post Tokyo. You know what happens after clinical kind of events? There's a big high, and then there's a drop off. And what we want to try and do, okay, let's make sure when you drop off, you actually got something to pick up and start moving forward, whether it's retirement or it's keeping going, whatever it is. Because that well being part becomes really important. And it's the same with you guys. When you achieve a big goal, you feel really good, but often there's a little bit of bad afterwards. Okay, so going back to what you said, it's reassessing the whole time. Okay? And if you're reassessing the goals and things you can't control, it never stops. Now getting better never stops. There's no destination to this. No one is there. I've met no athlete that's there. If you look at you know three questions, have you reached your potential? I haven't met anyone that's reached their potential. Has anyone met anyone that's reached their potential? No. So it doesn't stop. Do you want to get better? That's oh, a shit deal. So what does that look like? And then what's your next level looking like? So whether you're world class, whether you're just started your sport, what's your next level? What's your next level of that technique? What's your next level of that physical? What's your next level of that mental, nutritional, life balance, tactical? What are you trying to do each and every time to get better? Now, some people that really excites them. Some people it doesn't. I can't excite you, the coaches can't. This is where your goals become so important. And if you drop it down one more, that why becomes even more important. Being clear on why you're doing what you're doing. Okay? And when you think about your why, and again, you can do this in your head. If I said to you, what's your why for playing sport? Just answer it in your head now. What's your why? What is it? What's this sport giving you? And when you've got that answer in your head, I'm going to ask you again, why? And once you've got that answer, 
So we go again, we learn five times. So really unpack the why. Because the why starts driving your behaviour. The why will start driving when it's hard. Because often, you know, why do people play sport? Often it's because they want to make mum and dad proud, their family proud, they want to be a play for New Zealand, all that kind of stuff, which is great, but, but why? What's that actually going to give you? Because sometimes we get a false sense of security, what it will give us. I remember working with a team, it was a national team, but it was quite a small team. Not a great crew, not a lot of members. We, did, we spent probably an hour and a half hearing the whole team around what their why was. It was a team that was self funded so they had to pay for themselves. So the motivation had to be reasonably high to do it. At the end of it, their best player said, oh, I'm giving up. And the coach looked at me with daggers. First time I worked with that team, last time too, I wanted to. I said, Why is that? And she goes, Well, I have it. She says, I'm doing this because nobody wants me to do it. I'm doing this because I'm good at it. But I don't want to do it. So ironically, she stopped playing. But three years later, three years later, she came back. Why do you reckon that was? Why'd she come back? Yeah, she found a why. She found the enjoyment part. She found love, fell in love with the sport again. So if you guys, it's the same thing. What do you love about your sport? I mean, just because you love it doesn't mean you need to represent your zone to love your sport. Just because you love your sport, you can be a great club person and be the best you can be playing that. Now, some of you may want to go higher up, that's awesome. But the why becomes just as important. Because if your why is strong enough, when you leave here tonight, you look at some of your notes and go, which bits can I start doing? If your why is not strong enough, you leave here tonight and go, right, it's a party this weekend. That's fine too. Because the only person who gets reward from it is you. So when we look around motivation to winning, redefine it. Make sure you can control it. You can control it. There's a sense of obvious and control of this. You've got more chance of moving forward. Okay. Well, I'm just conscious of the time. Anything else that we haven't covered off that you talked about you want us to touch on now? Any questions or thoughts? Yeah. Is there anything about this that changes as you go into higher levels of sport? Like, in terms of mindsets and mental prep and things like that, or you just keep going? Um, look, from my experience, the higher you go up, the something it becomes, because they struggle with that. Okay. And even my role, you know, is as we go into finals week, we say this week, it's just simple stuff. And often, you know, people come and expect this high level kind of, it's like, no, it's just do the simple thing as well. Turn up on time, be prepared, eat well, go to sleep. Train properly. It's not. It's not hard. The size we we overcomplicate it. Okay. As I said, the higher you go up, all you see is that the simple thing is more consistent. And I keep saying it to you. I'm, I'm really lucky. I've worked with Tom Walsh for maybe 11, 12 years now. So after maybe second year or so, I'll go to the States. For, and I have a month in the States because he's based in the South East for five months. And the day to day is exactly the same. It's up at seven, stretch, breakfast, gym, come back, recover, lunch, training session or double gym session. Come home, dinner, Netflix, bed, nine o'clock. That's it. It's no secret to it, but he's prepared to stick to that consistently. That's the same with you guys. Now, what are your habits and routines you need to put a high price on? And the best athletes are just more clear on their habits and routines. Do they do them 10 out of 10? No. Nine? Sometimes. Eight? Yeah. So think about you know, when you play the best, when you perform the best, what goes underneath that? What does your training look like? What does your mental preparation look like? What do your relationships look like? What do you need to know? What does your study look like? It's you know, really hard to perform on a sad day if you're behind on all you study. Because the brain would go, oh gosh, there's other things I should be doing. So to answer your question on Wendley, no, it's just, it gets simpler the further you go up because they're just consistent with what they do. And that's the same thing. People get almost underwhelmed when you, when you meet some really people do this really well because it's not rocket science. Go to bed at the right time each night, it's not rocket science, you guys know that. Eating well, you guys know that. Train hard, you know that. Do this more consistently. And the reason I'm saying that, ordinary people do extraordinary things. Okay? 
have a big glaber. If you want it enough, if you're prepared to apply yourself, there's no limits. Within reason. If I can't now be an all black one, right? That's not too small. I've accepted that. But for you guys, the only limits are what you put on yourself. That's the exciting part. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts? Do you apply this stuff to like your team environment? Look, it's a really good question, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to give you a very good answer because, again, the further you go up, you get more and more like minded people. So it's easier. Okay? And I know, you know, the netball girls, the group, boys and girls, rugby boys and, and girls too, they struggle and they go to club stuff at times because it's different. And that's not a bad difference, it's just different. So part of it is almost you being really clear on well, what do you want to get out of that game and what's your success? Because you can have some people in the sport that literally is to catch up their mates, get a kick on Saturday night, and that's great. But for some of you, that's maybe not what you want to do. So it's really hard to change some of those people, so it's more about how you manage yourself and stick to your habits, your routines, and your standards. Right? But it's, it's, yeah, it's a real challenge. Especially if you've got a, you know, a row of people who said some want to be really good, some kind of do, and some potentially don't care. Is that what you're kind of talking about? Yeah. So there's not a thing you can do to fix them. I'll just try and buddy up the ones who are a bit more like-minded with you and not to train that way because some people don't. It's like we've got a lot of guys in the Canary Korean team who play country cricket and sometimes their club stuff is, you know, literally nine guys might turn up club cricket and say that. But it's the ability to go, well, do you go, it sounds terrible, do you, do you go down to that level or do you set your own standard? Because remember, said, well, if you train or if you practice, you'll get better at it. So set your own standard around it. Are there any other thoughts or questions? Uh, managing, like pushing yourself in training when the, the risk of failure is high, like a downhill mountain biking, for example, trying to grow with risk. So, it's not the risk of failure, it's just of injury, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah if you drop a ball in rugby, that's failure. You come yeah. off your bike and you're yeah, in the heat. So. so the question is how you manage that? Yeah, we you probably sort of pushing but not too much, managing the risk. Yeah. Yeah, look, I suppose it's, again, it's for that almost that grave exposure around what's this, you know, you go back to that comfort zone, uh, avoiding zone, learning, growth and stretch is where you need to sit and making sure you're probably not going to st too stretch zone or if you are, being clear what that looks like for yourself. Mm -hmm. Because there's some sports where there is a risk. So probably it's around, well, what do I need to do to give my brain clarity? Because remember, the brain won't want to do that. Doesn't make sense, does it? Mm -hmm. So how do you create the brain safe? Well, practicing the skill on its own first, building up, building up, and that's from saying some people just go mad and just go for it, but I think all those people can almost traumatise themselves too. Around it. So small steps are probably the easiest way to understand. Right, this conscious of time. So look, if there's any other questions, please feel free to stay on. I can answer them at the end. Otherwise, I'll thank you for your time, and hopefully there's a couple of things that you can play around with. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, John.